One of my favorite filmmakers of all time is a guy called Sergei Parajanov, whose films were popular in the 60s and 70s. But I've noticed most people either don't know who he is, or if they do, they think it's weird. It's extremely visual, and a lot of people struggle with the non-linear plot elements. But I find the visuals to be breathtaking, some of the most impressive I've ever seen on screen. His style is extremely distinct, but it has been imitated by other filmmakers more recently. But I'll talk about that later. And before I tell you about the actual person, I want to show you a short sample of his work, so you can see what a romantic visionary he was, and also a ballsy madman. When I first started watching his films in college, I was immediately struck by the elaborate sets and costuming. Every prop is an art piece in and of itself. Everything on screen has a very specific meaning, and the attention to detail is insane. He had a unique use of motion and stillness, and he was making things look like they were in a dollhouse way before Wes Anderson. His films also included elements of horror, they remind me of some nightmarish tarot card. Especially these clips from his 1967 film Syat Nova, generally considered to be his crowning achievement. But his films didn't always look like that. He was born in 1924 in Tiflis, Georgia, which sits right in the crux between Eastern Europe, Russia, and the Indian subcontinent. Tiflis, the metropolis of the Eurasian borderland, is noted for its hot sulfur spring. The people form cosmopolitan crowds. Georgians, Persians, Jews, Armenians, Turks, and Tatars, and the mountain tribesmen, all giving the impression of the bold, free life of old Georgia. Tbilisi had a very rich uh, cosmopolitan culture because historically it was surrounded by three very powerful empires, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. But by the 20s, Georgia was completely under the control of the Soviet Union. And if you were a regular person, your life was all about the tension between your old traditional ways and the new Soviet stuff. The new capital building of Georgia, with its contemporary Soviet architecture, and the inevitable statue of Lenin, contrast sharply with the daily life of the Georgian people, who still live much as their ancestors did hundreds of years ago. After primary school, he went to the Tbilisi Conservatory where he studied voice and violin. And you can see this great sensitivity to music in his films. I think also his knowledge of music helped him think about film in a different way, as film as a kind of musical structure. Later, he enrolled at the VGIK, or the All-Union State Institute of Cinematography. And I think if you want to start unlocking Parajanov's film style, you need to consider what the students at the VGIK were being taught. After all, the faculty included such legends as Lev Kuleshov, and Sergei Eisenstein. So the students were exposed to a very sophisticated mix of film theory, philosophy, art history, literature, and this all informed their aesthetic. But even though he was learning how to become a master filmmaker, the censors in Soviet Russia had such a tight control on media that he could only produce scripts that were handed down. These were mostly low-budget genre films, and they weren't the best. But it wasn't until 1962, when he had a career-altering experience that would completely change the way he understood cinema. 
he saw Andrei Tarkovsky's surrealist masterpiece, Ivan's Childhood. So moved, he actually renounced all of his previous films. And from that point on, he began tapping into things like his own spirituality, his ethnic surroundings, and the avant-garde. His next film was a major game changer. It was only when he did Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors that everything coalesced for him as a filmmaker. This was a far cry from those state-sanctioned scripts. Obviously, the Russian censors weren't happy, and Parajanov started gaining a name for himself as a kind of political figurehead. This new style championed poetic surrealism over Soviet realism. He was also known as a bit of an eccentric. He had some pretty passionate stances on the directing process, and he was pretty outspoken. But in spite of the negative Soviet response, Shadows of Our Forgotten Ancestors was a huge success for Parajanov, and it put his name on the map as one of the boldest new voices in world cinema. He met Vartanov, he befriended Andrei Tarkovsky, and the influence became mutual. It was then that he would start working on his most ambitious work to date. Syat Nova, or The Color of Pomegranates, tells the story of medieval poet Syat Nova, a kind of folk hero in Armenian culture. With this subject matter, Parajanov could fully embrace his love of religious iconography. And boy, did he. This movie changed my understanding of what cinema could be, and I'm not sure I've been quite as moved by another film since. Pomegranates was an even bigger success for Parajanov, and he began being known in the higher echelons of art cinema. He was being praised as a genius. Jean-Luc Godard is quoted as saying, In the temple of cinema, there are images, light, and reality. Sergei Parajanov was the master of that temple. That's high praise. The film was even screened at cons, but despite its success, the Soviet authorities had had about enough of this guy. It seems like it was just too surreal. It's so strange for Soviet reality, especially if he was speaking about such sacred things. He was not a clerical, Parajana was not a believer. He was not a hard believer. He liked all this rituals, habits, connected with Christianity, because he liked everything which was erzed, and uh, of course it was spiritual, but it was erzed with this um, appearance. And so not everyone was down with him using religion to tell what they saw as strange and esoteric stories. So by now the authorities were really watching him. And they actually started following him around. They began trumping up charges of artifact peddling and homosexuality, which of course was illegal in the Eastern Bloc. And he says here, um, the second director went on professional leave. The production manager, Melik Sargassian, who is a pensioner of the KGB, ruined work and is threatening to go on vacation. So with enough bogus charges, they were actually able to arrest him. But I just want to stop and think about that for a second. Can you imagine making a film so surreal that they had to lock you up? But that's exactly what happened. And for five years, Sergei Parajanov had to suffer in a gulag and was forbidden from making any more films. The imprisonment of Parajanov is a complex story. I, I think there are multiple reasons behind it. Of course, on the surface, there were the charges for which he was ultimately convicted, basically sexual crimes. 
The real reason why he was arrested, I think, has to do with his association with these Ukrainian nationalists. Because of what of Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, um, the film really sparked this poetic school in Ukraine. And he became the, the figurehead, in a sense, of these young Ukrainian filmmakers and intellectuals. So they were, in, in a sense, cutting off the symbolic head of this movement. Unbelievable. But by the time he was released, he was making films with guns blazing. Любят поэтический кинематограф как таковой. И любят вот на пляж, купят ласты, купят трусики, две маечки, фильтры и очки, и все получилось, все получилось. Поехали. А тут надо создать пластику, оружие, костюм, пейзаж, типаж актеров. В фильме и снимается еще вот блестящая лошадь. Безумной красоты сатрап. Пехи, пехи, там уже. А там вообще, а там вообще. After his release, and after 15 years of Soviet decline, he was finally able to start making his breathtaking films again. He shot Legends of the Saram Fortress in 1985, and Ashik Karib in 1988, both based on old ancient folktales, and both displaying a unique form of cinematic mesmerism. He again exhibits his love of using large groups of animals, as well as practical effects. Okay, now I want to talk about this modern filmmaker named Tarsem, who I'm actually really fond of, and I'll probably do an essay on him soon. He's made a number of semi-successful Hollywood films, and I actually really like his visual style. What is that copying progeny of? Here's what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm all for influence, but that's a bit on the nose. And it seems like this scene from The Fall reminds me a lot of this scene from Legends of the Saram Fortress. And this scene from Immortals reminds me a lot of this scene from Colors of Pomegranates. But I don't know, maybe it's just a coincidence. And I don't think it's wrong to be inspired by other filmmakers. In fact, when I was just starting out making my very first movie, I filled it with callouts to Pirojanov. But I consciously peppered them into a movie with a lot of different elements. I think paying homage to other artists is all about balance. You can strike a similar tone, but you can't literally do the same things that they did. That's just weird. But at the end of the day, I'm sure Tarsem just feels the way I do. How has no one heard of this legend? Watching his films transport you to another world, and they're completely unlike any other film by any other director. It chills me down to my soul, and it saddens me that he didn't get to live up to his full potential due to political turmoil. Это правда. Но правда вознесенная в образ печали, надежды или любви, красоты. Я иногда рассказываю сценарий и спрашиваю, как вы думаете, это я выдумал или это правда? Все говорят, это вы выдумали. Нет, это правда, которую я додумал. Thanks for watching. I just started a Patreon account, so if you want to pay it forward and help support future videos, click the link. By the way, did you know that Sergei Parajanov has a museum dedicated just to him in the capital of Armenia? You can see his artwork and various displays. It's pretty cool. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>